Our panel this evening represents a gathering of thoughtful, experienced journalists who have demonstrated the spirit of journalistic independence in their own work and who have a deep knowledge of the issues laid out in the stories and the images that John Albert presented in his address to us. The panel will be uh, moderated by uh, Rick MacArthur uh, in the middle. Uh, Rick is a journalist, author, uh, president and publisher of Harper's Magazine. And he is joined on the panel on your far right by Walter Pincus, who covers the intelligence community and national security for the Washington Post. He shared with four colleagues the Pulitzer Prize in national reporting in 2002 for coverage of America's war on terrorism. Uh, Chris Hedges is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author of several books. He spent nearly two decades as a foreign correspondent in Central America, the Middle East, Africa, and the Balkans. He is currently a senior fellow at the Nation Institute and posts a column each Monday, Monday on Truthdig. And our medal winner, John Alpert. I wanted to get right to a, a case study that we could discuss. Uh, James Risen. 2004, New York Times, a Washington uh, reporter, uh, gets the story before the election, uh, for the, uh, for, uh, the November 4th, uh, that the NSA, uh, National Security Agency, is conducting illegal wiretaps, or at least what we think were uh, unconstitutional wiretaps, domestic wiretaps. It's a long story, I have to compress it. Uh, the New York Times, uh, including the publisher of the New York Times, met with, uh, uh, I don't know if it was Bush personally, but with White House officials, uh, and the Times was persuaded not to publish the story. Now, uh, some of you, most of you, some of you probably know the end, how the story ends, but some of you may not. So to keep you in suspense, let me first ask uh, Walter Pincus, uh, if you'd been in uh, uh, Ryzen's situation and you got the news from the uh, bosses that we're just not going to run it, uh, for whatever reason, national security, uh, don't want to wreck our relationship with the White House, whatever, uh, what would your response have been? What would you have done? Well, I think I've been in semi-similar situations. And I think that, uh, as I mean, James Risen was an experienced reporter. And I think there are times when we do things that uh, governments argue you shouldn't print. And there are times when actually we don't print things. And so to, to second guess what happened, I think, is rather difficult. Uh, a case I was in uh, involved publishing a, a piece of information about how we uh, discovered a spy. And uh, after it was published, uh, the White House and the CIA came in and saw our editors and said, uh, we don't want that referred to again because it could give away the source of where the information came from. And so we didn't publish it again. Um, there are times when we don't publish, and we as a matter of policy, don't publish the names of people who are uh, acting for the CIA in a covert situation. That's their job. Their name really isn't important. So you withhold that name unless but Walter, they announce it. But just for this hell of it, let's second let's let's second guess. You want to second? The, let's let's, let's second guess and just just pause it. Say you were angry and you thought this is absolutely essential that we get this out, even if it's not in the New York Times. Uh, tactically, what do you do? Well, first place, we don't publish information like that without government going to the government to let them comment on it. 
Okay. That's, a, that's just okay. a statement. So they know the information we're about to publish. Okay. And then the standard we generally use is, A, is it important? B, is it going to harm national security the way we look at it? Because we, have, we make the judgment. They come in and make their arguments, and then in the cases I've been involved in, I know the case Bob Woodward's been involved in, we get a chance to sit in and make our arguments. And then it's, a, again, it's up to the editor. But if it's still no, and Chris, you can join in now, please, because Chris has worked at the Times and has worked in, a, in an, worked in an institutional setting before he went off the reservation. Uh, uh, supposing they still say no, and you're absolutely determined to get it out, what's your first move? What do you do? You just, you just think it's a matter of principle and it's got to be published somehow, somewhere. What would you do in the name of journalistic independence? Either one of you. He'll rise and put it in his book. <laughs> well, but he waited for a year. Yeah, but he put it in his book and... Uh, uh, and you, you, the, the point, the, the point it, it's essential to get it out before the election so that people know about it before they go to vote. I mean, you have to go to an alternative news source. I mean, that's probably, that's a very difficult thing when you're, you know, working for, as a staffer for a particular news organization. But if you want to get it out, then either you take it to an alternative news source or you give it to somebody at an alternative news source or run it. You leak to another newspaper or to another journalist, in effect. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I can, I can, yeah. I mean, I've had that happen. I've had people, I've had journalists, I mean, I was overseas, so it was a little different, but I've had, uh, actually, uh, Michael Kelly ran into some stuff in the war in Bosnia that uh, the Atlantic wasn't going to run, and he came to me, and we put it in the Times. But he found the story. His name was never on the story. Okay, that's a practical... Uh, approach. Walter, have you ever done anything like that? Have you ever leaked to another reporter a story that you thought was so important that the Post didn't want to publish, that you thought it had to get in somewhere else? You tell somebody else about it? I, I'm probably not that good a reporter to have information that good <laughs> that the Post didn't publish. I have, okay. They've never not published what I wanted to publish. Okay, let's, let's bring it down a couple of levels and say uh, it's not quite as dramatic, maybe, as the Ryzen story. And I'm going to get back to you with, to talk about television. Uh, uh, a story where you, they're just burying your stories. A lot of your stories about the uh, phony um, uh, uh, nuclear capability of Saddam Hussein uh, were buried in the post. Anything contradictory to the official White House line. Uh, he was doing the stories, I assure you, but they were getting buried. Uh, at what point do you act on that? Or do you just say, look, uh, I'll live to fight another day, the way uh, John said he did in that one instance, I think. He said, I'm not going to take on GE if they have a, a decent case to make. Why, why pick a fight with the bosses right away? Uh, at what point do you say this is enough? I quit, or I, or I go start my own uh, newsletter, or I uh, give the story to somebody else? How far do you have to get pushed? I'm just persistent. I just keep writing the stories. And they do get published. I don't like where they are, but I don't run the paper. I certainly argue about it. But I, I uh, belong to an extraordinary news organization, and, and maybe I've just been lucky. But okay. I've never had a story not published. Okay, I'll give you an example of your extraordinary news organization, self-censoring, and we could discuss this. Uh, the Washington Post broke the story very admirably of the black site prisons, the CIA black site prisons in 2005, I think. I forget, who, who broke it? Hmm? Who broke the story? Dana Priest. Yeah, Dana Priest. Uh, but in the story, you'll recall, perhaps, that they declined to name, to say where they were. I thought, reading the story, that this was an absolutely essential piece of information, not only because uh, people deserve to know where the secret prisons were located, because uh, they're being run in the name of the American people with our tax dollars, et cetera, et cetera, but also because it would have given the European Union 
a chance to act uh, against uh, two of their members. I think we know now they were Poland and Romania. But at the time, the Post took it upon themselves to say, uh, in, in the name of national security and to prevent reprisals against American installations or soldiers, et cetera, et cetera, we're not going to tell you where the black site prisons are, even though we know where they are. Uh, is that something that uh, is worth uh, firing, uh, getting fired over, or leaking to another news organization? Or what do you think, Chris? Is that, is that small potatoes? Uh, it's just not worth it. Especially if there's a chance you're gonna get caught. They figure out you're the, you're the source of the leak. Well, again, I have to speak as a reporter who worked overseas, um, and there's a kind of cross-pollinization overseas that you probably don't get domestically because every night, the Washington Post, the LA Times, all the networks were all eating in the same restaurant. Um, and uh, especially in a conflict zone, as John knows, you don't go out alone. Um, uh, you, we often travel with other journalists. So um, there was a kind of free exchange of information, and if stuff didn't get run that we thought should be run, there was usually someone around who was going to run it. Um, I mean, you'd be the perfect person to hand it off to. So I think that, uh, um, uh, I think overseas, and especially when you're in a conflict zone and you're emotionally caught up in the conflict, I don't think anyone who was in Sarajevo as I was during the war uh, was quote unquote neutral about it. I mean, we were there because we understood that this was an egregious crime against humanity and there was a kind of solidarity in many ways among the press that you don't get, I think, out of Washington. Uh, so uh, if we came upon stories, the networks in particular were running into stuff in Bosnia uh, towards the end of the war that they weren't putting on the air uh, because uh, the argument was that, well, we, you know, we've been seeing these images for three and a half years. Uh, and the network people who under, you know, it was very dangerous to film in the streets of Sarajevo uh, or certainly within the countryside in Bosnia. If they got stories that wouldn't run, they wouldn't let them sleep. They'd usually get them to me or to someone else they'd, to get them out. Wouldn't you say, John? Uh, uh, you've had the same kind of experience. Yeah, I mean, I haven't had that type of experience recently because um, um, although we had uh, uh, camaraderie, we were, we were lone wolf in it uh, in, in, in many cases. But um, the reporters do stick up for each other. Uh, in, in, in many instances, we're the only people that have each other's backs, and, and there are a lot of people after us, and so there, there is the desire to help everybody get their stories out. And um, even though we all have some proprietary interest in the story, if it's an important story, we're gonna give it to somebody else. Okay. Uh, could the three of you talk a little bit, since you've all worked for big organizations, and let me tell you, having worked for big organizations and published uh, my own investigative reporting in the New York Times, it's great to have a big club. It's so much better uh, than being on your own with your own newsletter. It has more instantaneous impact. It also uh, is nice to have the backing of a big corporation or a big uh, institution when you start getting attacked uh, by critics and, you know, on the right, the left, whatever. Uh, talk a little bit about, because this is in the context of, of journalistic independence, what you give up when you give up that institutional backing. Walter hasn't given it up yet, so Chris, what's it like not to have the institutional backing in the New York Times now? Because there are tremendous advantages to it. Um, when they're on your side. You, well, and of course the issue of lawsuits is huge because if you're an independent reporter, um, you know, libel cases can run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, uh, so it's nice to be able to have a team of lawyers vet your material, which they do when you do investigative pieces, uh, and, and know that uh, the New York Times legal team has never lost a case. They've paid a few people off, but they've never lost a case. Um, 
I mean, I think in my own case it was a kind of evolution, so that by the time I left the New York Times, they were as happy to see me leave as I was as happy to go. Um, I just felt increasingly constrained reporting domestically in a way that I had not been overseas. It was uh, very uh, easy to go on a program like Fresh Air and speak very, very frankly about Slobodan Milosevic and who he was and what he was doing in Bosnia. Uh, it was very hard to do that when you were talking about George W. Bush. Um, so the same kind of standards that I had set as a foreign correspondent and the same kind of bluntness that I had had in covering you know, many of the major conflicts around the globe for two decades uh, got me into a lot of trouble at the paper. And uh, I, I just felt incredibly constrained. Um, you know, I, like John, came at the root, or well, my route to journalism was unorthodox. Uh, graduated from seminary, lived in a housing project, went off as a freelancer to Latin America because I thought it was as close as my generation was going to come to fighting fascism. Uh, this was a time of Pinochet, the dirty war in Argentina. The death squads in Salvador were killing between 700 and 800 people a month. And so uh, I, I was never interested particularly in a career. Um, I ended up at the New York Times really by accident. And, um, and I, I felt the walls really close in. And I think also that uh, as the press financially and uh, culturally felt more under siege, uh, there was less and less room for voices like mine within uh, traditional institutions. So uh, it was, I mean, I left over public denouncements of the war in Iraq, uh, but I think the time was coming anyway when it just wasn't going to work anymore. It was a kind of um, uh, moral focus that I had had that had driven me into wars uh, um, out of a, a degree of anger, out of a sense of injustice, um, just made for a very uncomfortable fit in the newsroom. So it doesn't kill you to have lost the institutional affiliation. This is what I'm trying to get at, right? No. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't, you don't get up in the morning saying, gee, I wish no. I still had the institutional no. affiliation and no, backing. No, I'm very happy, but, the, yeah. but I've been able to, my books sell enough that I can make a living. And if your book, if you write books, which I do, and they and and they don't sell like that, then you, you know, in the end, you have to pay the rent. And what about you, John? Do you, do you miss the NBC affiliation? Do you miss the the power? The I did. That's, that's, uh, that, that, that accompanies it because, of course, it's not just they'll back you up. It's also the calling card. You say, "I'm showing up from NBC." Everybody straightens up and flies right, or from the New York Times, or from the Washington Post. You show up and say, "I'm from Community." Uh, DCTV, DC TV, uh, Downtown Community Television, uh, the, the, the reaction, the reception is a little bit different. It, it certainly is. Um, I used to like walking around airports in Kansas City and having somebody come up to me and ask me how this particular farmer was doing that had been featured in a report. Um, I liked the fact that people were eating their breakfast all over America and watching these stories. Um, um, I make programs to have people see them. And when you lose that, um, you sort of feel like the, uh, the kid at summer camp was not allowed to go in the swimming pool. And you just have to sit there and watch everybody else. And it's really, really frustrating because it gets in your blood um, and it makes you feel useful. Um, this is a wonderful job that we all have in which we can feel like we're doing something that's very, very useful. And so when I get frustrated, and I'm frustrated about some things right now, um, I get in my bus. And so we built a bus that has a video wall on the side of it. And when we want people to see our programs and I can't talk HBO into seeing them, we get on the bus and we park this in a town square someplace and we show our programs. <laughs> and it's back to the mail truck. I mean, um, my, my high school uh, folks will tell you that they always thought I never had an original idea in high school. So it's the same thing that we did with the mail truck. We're just doing it with a bigger truck. And I actually have two DCTV staffers here who are organizing a program that nobody wants to broadcast. We're fighting against gun violence. And we're going to take this bus to 20 cities. And we're going to have town meetings. We're going to talk about gun violence. We're going to try to find solutions. So I don't have a network that will broadcast it. OK, I think I, got, I, I think I got to the point I wanted to get to, which is there are not just career implications uh, or career consequences uh, from 
uh, exhibiting or exercising journalistic independence, there are also emotional consequences. I mean, it hurts to lose the audience. It hurts sometimes to lose the. Devastating. It's devastating to lose the ins and 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 it's tougher to me. I, I mean, all the things that come with the ins on. yeah with the institutional affiliation. Now let's have some questions, uh, right here, in front. Who are you asking? Ask Chris. Well, ask Chris. Okay. Money. I mean, uh, well, I, I covered Al Qaeda out of Paris for a year. I wrote five. Oh, sorry. I covered Al Qaeda for a year out of Paris for the New York Times, and um, uh, I wrote five stories um, and spent most of the year living in the Hotel de Louvre uh, and flying all over Europe and the Middle East. Uh, my budget excluding salaries for the first year in the war in Bosnia was $600,000. Um, so covering conflicts or doing investigative reporting is incredibly expensive. Uh, and that's a big problem. If you don't have that kind of backing, uh, it's very hard to do foreign reporting or investigative work. Yeah, money is a big thing. I can tell you, as a publisher too, right here. Well, uh, information that Americans, we know, we criticize other nations for doing precisely what we're doing, quite frankly. So I'm, I'm just asking you, are we living in a society that we believe we're living in, or are we living in a dream? Okay. I don't, want to, I, I don't want them to answer that question because it's too broad. Uh, and and uh, let's just agree that a lot, of, a lot of information gets suppressed. We know it. You know it. The question here today is what to do about it. Uh, and we, I hope we have some students in here, uh, right here. Yeah, I, I am not a student. <laughs> okay, but maybe, I work, okay. But, um, um, I, I'm with the American Civil Liberties Union. My okay. Name is Michael McLeod Ball. Uh, current issue in uh, Congress is whether there should be a federal reporter's shield statute to provide privilege, uh, and, and the issue seems to be right now in particular whether there should be uh, protection at all when the reporters are working in the area of national security and whether the government should, should essentially get the benefit of the, of the doubt, the uh, uh, you know, just trust us uh, kind of benefit uh, when there is a question of whether a reporter should be compelled to testify in some sort of, uh, in some sort of legal proceeding. And so I'm, 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 I'm asking the panelists uh, whether that has a practical implication in their day-to-day -day work and then the second part of that, which is also part of the legislation, is you know one of the issues is who who is a reporter that's entitled to the to the privilege, and do the new media uh, reporters get the same kind of protection uh, or not as as the folks that are on the panel? Walter, please answer that. <laughs> um, if you read the paper tomorrow, you see one answer. No, I wrote about it in tomorrow's paper. Um, there is a Shia law that's being promoted up on the Hill. It is a very complicated piece of legislation. It's not quite as simple as everybody makes it out to be. And the fact, the cold fact, for my kind of reporting is, it's not going to cover me. Um, a lot of people are worried about that. I uh, don't believe <laughs> in a shield law, which gets my paper very upset. Uh, I basically don't believe in it because I'm asking people, uh, in effect, to break the law, to give me information. And they face uh, loss of job and, and possible prosecution. And I think I ought to face the same problem because it'll make me make a firmer judgment 
about whether the information is needed, worth publishing, and if they're willing to stand up for it, and it's accurate. Uh, I ought to face the same problem, and in fact, I have, so um, I can look at it that way. There's an interesting problem in going to Congress for a shield law, because most uh, privileges, lawyers, attorney-client privilege, priest, penitent, and all those, are privileges that have been earned by court decisions, not by the law. So on the one hand, we have lobbyists going up and going to the same Congress we cover, the same kind of lobbyists that we criticize are representing the media to get a shield on. The second part of it, and fits into what you're saying about who's a journalist. Journalists argue about should it include bloggers, should it include people who do newsletters, who should it include as journalists. In the bills that are before the House and the Senate, there's also a provision saying that law won't cover uh, persons who are agents of foreign powers or associated with or have aided a whole series of groups that are now on a terrorist list. The media people never talk about that. So what, what the impact of it is is that Congress is eliminating a group of people. And if this were, as I once wrote, if this were 40 years ago, it would say communists or fellow trappers. If it was the 60s, it would probably say um, anti-war practitioners, maybe Black Panthers, anybody who supports the Black Panthers. So we're, we're giving Congress the idea of being able to establish who's a journalist, who's going to be covered. And that's another reason why I'm against it. Um, there is a very important part of it, though, because in civil suits, um, it's become sort of uh, almost a practice now that people who feel, particularly ex-government employees, who feel they have had unflattering stories written about them, and even people who have been in, gotten into trouble and lost their jobs, they can turn around and sue under the Privacy Act against their bosses or former colleagues who uh, leaked the information about them in the unflattering stories and put us in the middle. Uh, and, and many of the subpoenas most recently that don't involve national security or, or leaks from criminal cases have been these Privacy Act cases. So I think by should the, is the reason in that case I think it's useful. But I think in cases of national security, and then to sort of top it off, you get the whole lecture. In the, in the House bill, in order to get it passed by the House with the support of business interests, Chamber of Commerce, they treat equally to national security. In other words, a story appears that violates a trade secret, or violates medical records, or violates private banking records, that also will be treated in the same way uh, as national security. And that was the way they got the Chamber of Commerce to support the bill. Uh, we don't have much time. The, the, I'll just quickly say that uh, journalists, as a practical matter, also need help. And I'll give you an example. Uh, is it Diaz, the lawyer in, at Guantanamo, the army lawyer who leaked the, the, the list of uh, detainees, or, excuse me, prisoners, there I go into Pentagon speak, uh, prisoners, uh, to, they, he sent, he folded it up, he mailed it, regular mail to the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York, and the legal director, I'm sorry to say, the Center for, Center for Constitutional Rights, which I like very much, without asking any of her colleagues what to do, uh, sent it to the judge in the case. Uh, so instantly they were able to track down, I think his name was Diaz, the lawyer, the army lawyer who was outraged by the treatment of the, pri the prisoners and thought it was unconstitutional and they busted him and, and put him in jail for six months. 
Uh, so as a practical matter, uh, you need, you don't just need, and as Chuck, Chuck Lewis knows better than any of us, you need protection of the leakers, not of the uh, first, maybe of the reporter's second, though I think in, in principle I agree with Walter. Uh, but the leakers have to be protected. But even with the protection uh, under law of leakers, you have to have go-betweens and journalists and publishers who are willing to publish the information. Uh, if uh, the legal director of the CCR had sent it to Walter or sent it to me, I think we probably would have published it. Well, I, don't, I don't know if the Washington Post, but they very, very likely would have published the list. And of course, this was claimed to be a great national security secret, but in fact, the Pentagon was planning to release the names eventually anyway, because they were forced to uh, under the Supreme Court decision. So uh, you got to have, we, we need help, too, as a practical matter. I.F. Stone needed help. I mean, we can't all be I.F. Stone, but it sometimes needs to be a collaborative process between leaker, courageous uh, government uh, employee, Ellsberg, uh, well, Ellsberg's not working for the government at that point, but, but somebody who's very closely tied to the government or somebody who's literally working in the government. But that person has to know when they leak that the Washington Post, the New York Times, Harper's Magazine, NBC is going to back them up. And I can tell you as a practical matter, um, many of the discussions we have about what we're going to put in an article uh, and whether or not it's going to put the reporter at risk uh, eventually come around to, is it actually going to put the source at risk, the leaker at risk? And you have to reassure the leaker uh, that you're going to back them. You're going to protect them. You can do everything in your power to back them. Uh, more and more newspapers, magazines, television networks are unwilling uh, or unprepared to back the leaker, not just the reporter. And I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you to our panel. Uh, John Albert, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all for coming, and we are adjourned.